Welcome to Taiwan Report News Brief, news and analysis from Taiwan. I'm Donovan Smith. Up today, White Terror Database has been released. Land use plans have been panned. Stray euthanasia ban has been questioned. The government decides not to prosecute critics. EEPA has slapped Taichung's Liu Xiuyen administration. The KMT punts on the king of, Ga- of Hualien. And the KMT chair race rolls on. But first up, it's not yet in the English media, though it might be by the time you listen to this. Finally, after repeatedly saying that it was going ahead, Yen Qingbiao has announced that the Dajia Mazu Jenlan launched Mazu pilgrimage will be delayed this year over coronavirus fears. This is a big turnaround considering that he had been maintaining a stance of telling everyone not to worry because Mazu would eradicate the virus. Meanwhile, Tsai, President Tsai Ing-wen has halted preparations for her inauguration from the Taipei Times. President Tsai Ing-wen yesterday announced that she had suspended preparations for her inauguration ceremony, saying that she would not hold a large assembly amid fears of COVID-19 contagion. Any further plans regarding inauguration would be made according to suggestions offered by the Central Epidemic Command Center, she said in a statement on Facebook. Well, this sets a, a good a good precedent, and hopefully a lot of people will take note. Also in the Taipei Times, a white terror database has been released. The database, however, only includes information on cases taken to court and does not include details of other victims who are executed without trial. Now, it's, it notes here that Chiang Kai-shek presi- presided over 3,195 military court cases during the White Terror era, the most on record. The Transitional Justice Committee Commission, I'm sorry, said yesterday as the Taiwan Transitional Justice Database went online. Now, the database shows that both Taiwanese and mainlanders, those who fled to Taiwan from China with the KMT in 1949, were victims during the White Terror era, with Taiwanese accounting for 55% of the cases and mainlanders 44%. The main priority of the commission was to identify victims, how the victims were oppressed, and who the oppressors were, according to a spokesperson. So this is interesting that there is still a lot left to do. As it notes here, due to time and funding constraints, the database does not include information on the arrest and interrogation of victims or how the ruling was carried out. So uh, such information, such as whether torture was used during the interrogation and victims were harassed after their release, would form the basis of further investigation and research. This is a good step forward, but we don't know how much more they're going to do. There's quite a bit that's been left out here in the Transitional Justice Commission. It's good that they're working on these elements, but there's a lot of things that they've talked about doing and have yet to do such as the status of the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial, street names, and so forth, which they had previously said would have been tackled by now. All right, again in the Taipei Times, the cabinet is urged to scrap amendments. Proposed amendments to the Spatial Planning Act, by spatial they mean essentially land planning, might cause more environmental injustice under the pretext of major construction projects. Environmentalists and lawmakers said yesterday, urging the cabinet to withdraw the retrogressive bill. Now, the act passed by the legislature in 2015 was hailed as a milestone in environmental protection for classifying land rezoning into national reserve areas, marine resource areas, agricultural development areas, and urban development areas. It is expected to take effect in 2022. Now, the concerns are, and here's one that is that is used as an example, is under the pretext of so-called major construction projects, the government has pushed through many projects that have proved useless. Another example here is land expropriation in Dapu Borough in Miaoli County's Zunan Township to accommodate an expansion of the Shinju Science Park. That led to a lot of protests, a couple of suicides of people who lost their homes as part of that and had lived there for quite a long time. 
Now, that actually led to the protests that it led to. Were, were, there was several people involved in that that later went on to be key figures in the Sunflower Movement. Just an interesting side note. Now, the major concern here that environmentalists have is what do they mean by major construction projects? The government has a history of supporting major developments such as Asia Concrete, uh, creating a big mine in indigenous territory without uh, much approval from the locals, big hotels in nature spots, that sort of thing. On the other hand, there are certain kinds of major projects that do make sense. For example, if there has to be a new military installation, an extension of the high-speed rail, these kinds of things often could make sense. So it says here that it, the national spatial plans could be revised if the cabinet approves major construction projects, one of the amendments says. So basically, what it comes down to is, do you trust the cabinet? Moving on, euthanasia ban needs to be reevaluated. A ban on euthanize, euthanizing healthy stray animals, which has been in place for three years, needs to be reevaluated to see whether it really improves animal welfare. The Council of Agriculture Minister Chen, Ji, Chen Jizong said yesterday. Chen made the remarks during a news conference in Taipei held by several animal rights groups who have established an alliance to urge lawmakers to create more animal protection legislation. The alliance called for enshrining animal protection in the Constitution and legalizing a compensation mechanism for people whose animals, not necessarily pets, are hurt by others. Now, down here, it says... So they implemented this ban on euthanizing stray animals way back in February of 2017. So the minister, minister Chen goes on and says, while the council has dedicated considerable funds to promote its trap, neuter, vaccination and return program for stray animals, the number of stray animals has increased from 128,000 in 2017 to 147,000 while building new public animal shelters has proved difficult. Echoing Chen's concern, Animal Protection Association Chairman Li, Ch Li Zhao Chen <laughs> said that the ban was pushed by certain groups despite a lack of complementary measures. Now, this is true. There are some problems uh, in central Taiwan, for example. Zhanghua has seen a, a very large increase in the number of strays. They attempted, under Wei Mingu, the previous county commissioner, to build a animal park and a center to house these stray, stray animals because they don't have enough capacity to handle the ones they have now. And since they can no longer euthanize them, they can't create new space. So there have been packs roaming around um, in areas. Herme recently had a big problem, and some of them are dangerous. Now, they, their plan to build that new park and shelter was stopped by protests in the uh, uh, people who lived in the town came out. And if memory serves, it was in Shihu. The residents had very serious complaints and eventually managed to get the project shut down. So the question, of course, is then what to do about it? So that's why perhaps they may reverse that ban. We'll see. All right, moving on. Authorities decide not to prosecute arms sales critics. Taipei prosecutors yesterday decided not to prosecute six people who claimed that the Ministry of National Defense was paying too much for the procurement of F-16V planes, as their comments were deemed a reasonable discussion on interests uh, on issues of public interest. After messages by the six people were last year posted and circulated on social media, ministry officials issued clarifications saying that some of the figures quoted were misleading or factually incorrect and filed a judicial complaint alleging that the six were disseminating misinformation. The Criminal Investigation Bureau tracked down and identified the six and filed charges for breaches of the Social Order Maintenance Act, but the Taipei District Court decided not to impose punishment. It does seem a little excessive, of course, to 
try and file charges for people complaining or commenting on issues online. Over on Focus Taiwan, EPA, Taichung at odds over resumption of coal power generators. Now, I've been covering this quite a bit for the ICRT Central Taiwan News segments on Wednesday mornings, which is about 8.05 if you want to listen in. Now, the central, at the central core of the problem is this. The Taichung power plant was, until uh, two or three years ago, the largest coal-fired power plant in the world. One or two have been built since that are now bigger. But until a few years ago, Taichung had the worst air quality in the country, and it's still not good. While it's improved significantly, this power plant remains the largest single stationary source of air pollution in the entire country. So, uh, for obvious reasons, residents are not happy. Taichung Mayor Lu Xiuyan based her, her campaign largely around this issue, which was a little bit silly in the sense that the Taichung city government has limited leverage, and her predecessor, Lin Jialong, had been doing pretty much everything he could within his power. However, the public didn't really quite understand the nuance, nuances of this. She came into power and started doing everything she could. She's been finding the power plant every opportunity possible for any possible violation they can find, more or less. And they, in December, announced that they were revoking the coal use permits for the plant's number two and number three generators, effective January 2020, after contending that the power plant had violated related laws three times in 2019. Now, the city government claimed that the Taichung power plant was using far more power sorry, far more coal than they were allowed under previous agreements. The problem is, is the way that the phrasing was, is it seemed that the, the amount that the Taichung city government was demanding that they reduce it to was, should have actually gone into effect this year, not last year. And there is different wording. The, it looks like the intent of the way the permit was supposed to be written and the way it was actually written when it was issued were different, meaning that it was intended to be by January 20, uh, by mid-January 2020 is what they wanted the, the, to them to bring the limit down to. However, in the phrasing of the actual permit, it says starting from, and it's a small word change. And so that would mean that starting from the middle of January this year through the year, that this was their new limit. The Taichung city government applied what they what was originally most likely intended. Tai Power followed what was the wording in the agreement. The EPA, of course, stepped in and has slapped down the Taichung city government. And they've been going at it back and forth. The KMT caucus and some lawmakers came out and called the EPA hired thugs of Thai power. All right. And this is interesting here. Now, this is from the KMT official website. In a separate news story, whether or not to reinstate legislator Fu Quanxi's KMT membership has drawn divergent views within the KMT. An unnamed KMT figure states that the matter has caused internal friction in the KMT, so there will be no more discussions about it in the near future, adding that Fu's case will not be dealt with until a new KMT chairman is elected. That's probably a good idea. You can see our most some of my earlier reports over the week about him, but he's essentially been jailed repeatedly for and was kicked out of the party, but he was recently elected into the legislature. The KMT has only 38 their KMT caucus only has 38 members. If they can bring him in as an independent who essentially is KMT in all but name, then that means their caucus increases to 39. So that's the incentive for them to bring in, bring him in. But again, he's been repeatedly jailed and it's a bad look for the party. So we have here regarding this case, the two candidates for KMT chair, the, we have how long Bin has come out and said that he's for food to be reinstated into the into the party, while Johnny Chang essentially punted saying that, that he should go through normal procedures.
Now, moving on to the KMT chair race itself, this is interesting. This is on Yahoo News. It's a UDN report. And it says here they're talking about the Huang Fuxing, which I've mentioned before. This is the powerful military veterans group within the party. It makes up about 20% of the KMT party membership, but they tend to be more active and their turnout is higher when they actually vote. So they could account for as much as 30 or 40% of the vote, depending. Now, they tend to be very, very deep, deep blue. They're very conservative and they're very mainlander dominated. So the question is whether or not to reform the Huang Fuxing. Now, how long Bins says here that or to remove them. Now, he says definitely no need to remove them, but they need some reform. So essentially, he's standing by the Huang Fuxing and then saying, well, they just need a little bit of reform. Now, of course, everybody is capable of reform, but the Huang Fuxing is famously conservative and I find it that difficult to think to, or to accept that they're going to actually make much progress on getting them to reform. Meanwhile, Johnny Chang, Jiang Jitsun, uh, on the same issue, said that he, he says that reforming the Huang Fuxing is part of, part of the whole project of needing to reform the party itself in general. But Johnny Chang has been now he's really doubling down on the idea of reinvigorating the party for young voters. And he's been in the last, particularly in the last few days, has been pounding on this significantly. So right now there's a, a push by all the major parties to change the constitution to make it so that 18 year olds can vote in future elections. Now he's come out in support of this, but now he's doubling down and he's saying that 20-year-olds should be able to run for elected office. So he's essentially doubling down on that. Also in this UDN article, he talks an awful lot about how they need to be brought into the party, their opinions need to be listened to, there needs to be more transparency. Essentially, he's now campaigning as the candidate who can bring in the youth. All right, just going to mention a couple of, of interesting stories today for you to read. Uh, this is ABC Radio International. The article is Taiwan is standing up as an independent nation, but China won't make it easy. It's a pretty good article. There's a couple of little mistakes, but it got most things right. I was quite impressed. And the Scholar's Stage. This is Tanner Greer. He's a, a well-known international author for in many publications, including Foreign Policy. He's always worth following. Uh, he writes some excellent stuff. He wrote, losing Taiwan means losing Japan. And this explains how and why Taiwan is so important to the first island chain and for Japan to be able to defend itself. It's a very interesting piece. Be sure to check it out. All right. All the English articles here will be up on report.tw. Be sure to check them out if you want to look into in more detail. We also have frequently post up a lot of other stuff there. So be sure to check us out on report.tw and tune in tomorrow because, of course, the news keeps happening. Hey, I'm the Taiwan girl. I really like the Taiwan girl.